So I want to thank you all for uh, coming to this event. Uh, my name is David Weinstein, uh, and I have uh, two hats on, which you can't quite see. One is uh, the Associate Director for Research of, of the uh, Center for Japanese Economy and Business uh, here at the Business School, and uh, also as the Director for the Program for Economic Research um, uh, in the Economics Department. Uh, the Center, uh, under the leadership of Hugh Patrick, uh, has been uh, at the forefront of bringing top Japanese academics, business leaders, and policymakers uh, to Columbia for 25 years. Uh, building on its program on alternative investments, uh, the center uh, recently established a new program titled The New Financial Architecture, Japan and the United States. The purpose of this new program is to engage in analytical and policy-oriented research evaluations of major financial and economic issues uh, through conferences and research activities. Um, and this program uh, will highlight uh, um, and examine some of the dramatic financial system and regulatory changes that are underway in the United States, Japan, and the rest of the world. Uh, the Program for Economic Research is a newly formed uh, program in the economics department that's uh, seeking to foster economic research. And this year, uh, per Speaker series is also focusing on, financial, on, the, on the three R's of finance, uh, reform, regulation, and restructuring. Uh, and uh, so luckily there was a, a coincidence of interests, and I was delighted uh, that um, uh, uh, CJEB was willing to partner with us on uh, what is likely to be a fascinating uh, event. Um, the three speakers we, uh, four speakers we have here uh, all have had such distinguished careers that if I tried to introduce them properly to you, uh, I could easily spend all of my time discussing their accomplishments. Um, indeed, uh, as my students know, uh, I spend the better par part of a class just uh, discussing what uh, Heizo did uh, to privatize uh, Japan Post. Um, uh, those of you who know Japan will know that uh, prior uh, to the Takenaka reforms, uh, Japan Post was the biggest uh, bank in the world with about a quarter of all Japanese deposits. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, many of the Koizumi reforms have come under enormous attack uh, by the DPJ, and uh, many uh, suspect that uh, there will be a renationalization um, to the of, of Japan Post, moving us back to the pre-reform uh, days. Um, Heizo Takenaka uh, became one of the foremost Japanese economists. Um, and became famous for throwing himself into these massive restructuring programs that were often uh, extremely politically sensitive. Um, you know, I was trying to think about a comparison for the United States, uh, and it would be as if uh, one economist uh, handled healthcare reform, TARP, fiscal reform, uh, all at the same time, and succeeded. Um, this was an amazing uh, accomplishment, uh, especially in a society uh, that values conformity. Um, our sec uh, actually, our, our second Japanese speaker, uh, third in order, is uh, Takatoshi Ito, who comes to us from the University of Tokyo. Uh, Taka is a visiting professor in the business school um, and resides in the economics department, courtesy of PER. Uh, Taka is uh, not only a first-rate academic whose views on monetary policy um, have helped uh, shape my views, um, and uh, for those students of mine who are in the room, uh, beware, his ideas will be on the exam. Uh, but he has um, had a distinguished career um, in public service uh, at the IMF and during the Asian financial crisis and as a member of the Prime Minister's uh, Council for Economic and Fiscal Policy. Um, and actually, as I was just looking over the bios of Hezo and uh, Taka, I noticed that uh, Hezo's bio leaves off his election to the diet, and uh, Taka's bio leaves off the fact that he was vice minister for international affairs. And so I guess you know that you're eminent when you uh, cut things off your bio like this, uh, because they just don't fit. Um, uh, finally, I want to just say um, a couple of uh, words about our two speakers from Colombia um, who need much less of an introduction for uh, our local audience. Um, Patrick Bolton, who will be speaking second, is the David uh, Zalaznik uh, Professor of Business and uh, Professor of Economics in the Department. Um, Patrick is one of the foremost, uh, uh, excuse me, one of the most eminent financial theorists of his uh, generation. Uh, he has uh, an uncanny ability to make uh, seemingly complex ideas transparent and uh, is one of my favorite colleagues uh, uh, here at Columbia. Uh, finally, uh, our commentator, uh, Merit Jeno, 
is a professor of international economic law and international uh, affairs at uh, Columbia. Um, and she has had a distinguished career both at, in Columbia and um, in the private sector and in, and in government. Um, she most recently has become chairman of the NASDAQ stock market. Uh, Merritt is an amazing colleague who brings together uh, razor sharp knowledge of legal theory and practice, um, and she has promised not to sue anyone this evening. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I should also alert everyone that there are media present, um, and my understanding of this is that if you say anything interesting, you should assume it's on the record. Um, and now, without any further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Professor Takenaka. Well, thank you very much for nice introduction, David. Uh, it is a great pleasure to speak in front of uh, such a distinguished group of people at Columbia. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Professor Hugh Patrick and David Weinstein and all other people whose effort made this uh, opportunity possible. As was introduced, <coughs> I was in the gov Japanese government from 2001 to 2006 to work for former Prime Minister Koizumi. Uh, we challenged the economic reform, uh, like disposal of non-performing loan in the banking sector and privatization of Japan Post, etc. But after we left the government, things have obviously changed in Japan. One is a good change. My income increased because <laughs> I came back to the private sector. My wife is pleased with that. Another change which is much more important is that there was a political regime change based on the result of the recent uh, election, LDP, uh, which had long been in the government party, was seriously defeated and Mr. Hatoyama of DPJ uh, took office as the Prime Minister. It is the very first experience in the post-war period that such a regime change happened in Japan. And it should be noted that regime change happened in the midst of current global recession. So based upon this, I will speak mostly two issues. One is Japan's lesson from our financial crisis or uh, how to cope with the financial crisis. And the other is what happened and will happen in the Japanese economy and economic policy and the new administration. There's a lot of uncertainty because new government started just seven weeks ago. But let me try to provoke your thought on this issue. Let me start with discussing our experience of financial crisis about 10 years ago. Well, in the second half of 1980s, as you know, we had so-called bubble economy. Nikkei average became almost six times during this period. Then bubble burst uh, in 1989, uh, just 20 uh, years ago. At the uh, bottom wall of, of, of also uh, collapsed at that time, you remember. Anyway, since the burst of the bubble, the Japanese economy faced uh, many troubles. For example, 90s, it's a lost decade for us. Growth rate of Japan was only 1%. Uh, which could be compared with five to uh, four to five percent in the previous decade. In the 90s, the Japanese government made the kind of misjudging macroeconomic management after the burst of the bubble, so-called balance sheet adjustment, was needed. However, government uh, uh, increased only their expenditures on public works, while ignoring supply-side adjustment. Anyway, 90s. In the 90s, the Japanese economy was stagnant and balance sheet adjustment had been postponed. So in late 90s, uh, this caused a serious financial crisis in Japan. Uh, in the year 1997, for example, Yamaichi Securities, the second largest security company, went bankrupt. And Hokkaido Takshok Bank, one of nine city banks at that time, went bankrupt also. Under such circumstances, in 1998, a diet approved a new law under which public money can be used for capital injection to troubled banks. Yes, crisis needs government activism. Government activism is needed. So in 1999, total of 7.5 trillion yen, uh, this is 1.5% of GDP, was injected into major banks. However, this was not enough. Indeed, Japanese crisis subsided only in 2003, four years after capital injection. Let me 
raise three important lessons from our financial crisis. First, public fund injection alone did not solve the problem. Rather, second thing was important. There must be precise and strict asset appraisal at financial institutions. Only then should the necessary capital be injected. At the end of the 90s, Japan injected public funds while bad assets were still being concealed. As a result, a financial crisis continued even after the capital injection. The solution came only after 2002 when the financial revitalization program was introduced under the Koizumi administration. Under this program, very strict bank inspections were carried out and then necessary capital injections were made additionally. Uh, there was a capital injection into Arizona Bank in 2003, and then the situation began to improve. The second lesson is, yes, activism is needed. Gov government activism is needed, but sometimes government activi activism can go too far. Uh, when uh, ex excessive protection by the government is given to some, impact on others can worsen the crisis of confidence, you can imagine, maybe. In this context, in this context the world trend toward reversing mark-to-market -market accounting is troubling. In Japan, we had a similar experience. In 2003, when an election coincided with financial crisis, many politicians and industry groups called for suspension of mark-to-market -market accounting. In the end, the Japanese government, under the leadership by Prime Minister Koizumi, strongly rejected this view. If we had reverse market, mark to market accounting at that time, bad loan disposal and economic recovery would have taken even longer. The third lesson is about business sector or debtors or borrowers. Disposal of non performing loan in the banking sector is one issue and reduction of excess debt in damaged businesses was another one. This was another important factor. These were both sides of the coin, as you can imagine, so it is important to con uh, consider both of lenders and borrowers. Considering this, we established Industry Revitalization Corporation of Japan, IRCJ, in the midst of bank reform, and managed bankruptcy. Managed bankruptcy was an important key word. The role of IRCJ was to help balance sheet adjustment of debtors in the form of managed bankruptcy. Please consider the case of GM. This is a kind of managed bankruptcy, I believe. Anyway, IRCJ successfully finished its historical role and dissolved last year. Well, now then we come to the second point. How can new government cope with the crisis or uh, such a difficult economic situation? After Koizumi, the momentum of economic, economic reform disappeared, regrettably. The Japanese economy had been worsening again. So can Mr. Hatoyama <coughs> improve the situation or not? To say conclusion the first, there are some good signs, but more bad signs. This is my conclusion. At the same time, however, if Prime Minister Hatoyama changes some part of their policy-making style, uh, they will have a chance of success. First, I'd like to say that the Japanese economy is on the track of double-shape recovery. Double-shape recovery. Uh, since so-called Lehman shock last fall, our economy plunged dramatically. Uh, in, the last quarter of, uh, in the first quarter of last year, in the first quarter of this year, Japan's growth rate was amazingly minus 12% on annual base. But this declining trend stopped in the first quarter of this year, and now we see some sign of recovery. However, this recovery is not sustainable. This is the reason why I say double shape. A country current recovery is supported by two factors. One, Chinese economy is again growing very rapidly. Two, large scale of fiscal expansion is taken by the government. However, it is quite obvious that this kind of large scale fiscal expansion cannot be continued, considering the size of the fiscal deficit. I'd like to say that there are two special points to be watched very carefully 
regarding the new government policies. The first one is about their macroeconomic management. For some area, DPJ, new government, is proposing very good and attractive policies. There are, for example, open sky policies, or this is aviation policy, an anti-bureaucrat type of policy making, and promoting decentralization of power from central to local government, and so on. However, there is crucial and a very fatal weakness in DPJ's uh, macroeconomic management. Very interestingly and curiously, DPJ has not discussed explicitly macroeconomy so far. How high or low do they think the potential growth rate is? Do they think that growth capacity, growth capability should be strengthened or not? I dare to say that DPJ so far does not have any concept of the macroeconomy. There is a symbolic episode to show this point. Every year in the Diet session, DPJ, at that time this was the opposition party, DPJ submitted a proposal to change the component of government budget plan. As for macroeconomic prediction and the total size of the budget, they accept the government plan. Then they insisted only to change the component. Say, well, let's reduce the public investment, let's increase social welfare, etc., etc. I wondered why DPJ did not try to change the total size of the budget or total framework of the budget. Please imagine the following case. There is a blueprint for residents named Japan. And blueprint shows a very fabulous kitchen or a very fancy living room. But there is no information about total square feet of the house and no information about the shape of the roof. It is important now to reduce fiscal deficit in Japan. At the same time, it is required, required to stimulate aggregate demand continuously. So there is a very narrow path to be taken. Under such circumstances, I'm afraid that the size of the total budget will expand rapidly from now, and consequently, budget deficit will explore seriously. This must be true when we consider that upper house election will be held next year. The second point to be carefully watched is the dual nature or split personality of the new ruling party. DPJ leaders consist of three types of members, in my understanding. One is a very innovative group, like graduate of Matsushita Seikeijuku, or Matsushita School of Government and Management. This school was established uh, by a founder of Panasonic, Mr. Konosuke Matsushita, to grow up the future leaders. Uh, Mr. Maehara is a minister of land and transportation. Now, he's a leading figure in this category. Actually, Minister Maihara is advocating very innovative policy like open sky policy, as I mentioned. The second category is a former bureaucrat group. They, ha they have good knowledge about policy making, and Ms. Minister Fuji, Minister of Finance, and uh, Mr. Matsui, he's a Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary, are leading figures in this category. The third group is, uh, th the third is a group of people who represent special vested interest group. That members from labor unions are typical examples. Actually, some important leaders of DPJ used to be members of Japan Socialist Party. So reflecting such a dual nature of membership, some policies are very contradictory or inconsistent. For example, open sky policy that I mentioned is a very innovative one. Uh, this will strengthen and activate the Japanese economy through deregulation. This is the complete deregulation program. On the other hand, DPJ government is going to nationalize Japan Post again. Some people in DPJ extremely hate deregulation and privatization, American-style market economy. They often use this term. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some good policies discussed by the new government. In other words, as for micro-oriented policies of DPJ, some are very good. But there is no macroeconomic considerations. Also, some policies are contradictory to each other. What is common in this problem is a lack in headquarter function of policy making. Or they need something like a control tower to ensure consistency between macro and micro policies and consistency 
among various policies. Since the administrative reform in 2001, the Council of Economic and Fiscal Policy had been playing this kind of role as a policy headquarter. I was in charge of this council as a minister, and Taka Ito was a very important member of this council. However, Hatema government already declared to abolish this council to impress the regime change. In the place of this council, they promised to establish a new control tower named National Strategy Bureau. However, this is not functioning yet. One regret is that DPJ did not have an explicit transition team to make preparation for this. Uh, this is indicating at the same time that DPJ government still had a chance to make a success story if they can create a strong control tower or policy headquarter, they can change the current stagnant situation. So it is important to make strategy bureau workable. Anyway, uh, very regrettably after Koizumi, uh, political leaders have been paying more attention to populist type of policy rather than economic reform. For the time being, uh, Japanese economy will show some sign of recovery. It is because DPJ uh, government will continue expansionary fiscal policy. But this is not a well-designed macroeconomic management. This is a reflection of populism <coughs> considering the election next year. Also, this is a reflection of lacking control tower of economic policy. From now on, worldwide discussion on new regulatory framework on financial market will become much more important. Japan has to join and even lead the discussion on this reform of international monetary system. This will be uh, discussed by Professor Bolton later on. In that process, uh, creative cooperation between political leaders and the bureaucrats are also necessary. In LDP government, or in the old government, politicians depended too much on bureaucrats. On the contrary, in a new government, politicians tried to exclude uh, bureaucrats in extreme manner. In this regard, also, policy headquarters is necessary to, talk with, uh, to cope with current economic uh, difficulties. Uh, now we should watch two kinds of NPL. Finally, I'd like to say NPL very carefully. One is NPL is a non-performing loan. Another NPL will be new political leadership in the Hatoyama government. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Patrick Bolton. Yeah. Do you want to speak up there? there yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, these were uh, truly fascinating uh, comments by uh, uh, Professor Takenaka. Um, before I start, I would like to thank um, Hugh Patrick and uh, David Weinstein uh, for organizing this event, this very timely event uh, about uh, fundamental issues. And I'm uh, very honored to be part of the panel. Um, when I think about uh, um, the Japanese experience uh, in the 90s, uh, my, obvious cons my obvious first worry is, aren't we going to live through a similar lost decade uh, in the US? Um, we, we have a lot to learn from the, the challenges that uh, Japan faced in the 90s and uh, the kinds of issues, um, uh, the, the kinds of policies they implemented, uh, some of the, some of the um, policy um, uh, setbacks they had, but also the, the successes. And in particular, uh, of course, uh, I have in mind the banking situation in the US and, uh, and our own uh, non-performing loan problem. How we're going to address? How we're going to address that? Uh, now, what I have prepared uh, uh, for today, the comments I've prepared, though, uh, are more specifically about the U.S. experience and, and more specifically about the uh, U.S. experience uh, in the current crisis. Uh, I think there's a lot in common between what uh, ja Japan went through in the 90s, what we've just gone through. In particular, um, we've had a bubble preceding the crisis. We've had a bubble uh, in the real estate market uh, that has been um, fueled by lax monetary policy and by, uh, facilitated by uh, deregulation. That's what we have in common with Japan. Uh, our crisis has also been produced by a bursting of the bubble in, in the real estate market, which has then uh, uh, 
bled through uh, other asset, uh, asset markets. That's what we have in common. Um, the new twist, uh, uh, if I can use this word, uh, is, um, of course, that a special phenomenon uh, uh, that we've gone through in the US is this development of shadow banking, uh, the, the growth of securitization, repo markets, uh, which has uh, facilitated growth of uh, uh, subprime mortgages. So that's what I want to talk about, just quickly uh, r remind you of uh, what happened and, uh, and then uh, uh, say, a few, say a few words about the challenges we face with respect to that specific problem, shadow banking. How do we address it? How do we uh, address re uh, regulatory issues that, uh, that are coming up in this context? Here in particular, uh, I have uh, singled out uh, issues of incentives for originators and servicers of, uh, of mortgages, um, question of uh, whether um, loans should be allowed to be off the balance sheet of banks, problem of rating agencies, um, the role of uh, credit default swaps, capital requirements, and so on. And in many ways, these problems that we face in the US are common to um, all developed uh, financial uh, uh, markets, whether it's in, in Japan or in Europe. So some of these uh, uh, regulatory questions we're facing uh, are also, I think, challenges for the new um, uh, administration in Japan. So uh, I think uh, this picture summarizes uh, what has happened to us. Uh, you see this tremendous growth in issuance of asset-backed securities uh, over uh, the, la the past decade, or, or nearly uh, uh, entire decade, and then it all came, all came to a halt in the, in the, the spring uh, or the summer of 2007. Now, these markets have not, uh, basically have not revived. One of the major challenges that we face is how we're going to revive those markets. Um, we may not want to come back to you know, the, the heights of the, the bubble. Maybe were, those markets were too, had grown too large. But certainly, we will have to rely on securitization again. One of the key challenges we're going to be facing is how we're going to bring those markets back to life. Um, now, these are very complicated markets. Uh, I just, uh, uh, I'm showing you this, uh, this slide. Uh, I, I have an animated version, but it would take me too long to go through the animated version. It's just to sh show you the complexity of securitization. One of the, obviously, from, from a uh, regulator's perspective, the question is, do we need this kind of complexity, and why? So this is uh, some of the things I want to um, address now. Uh, so uh, I think um, if you ask, um, you know, why do we need the securitization? Well, there are a number of good reasons, and there are some bad reasons. Um, among, the, among the good reasons, I've listed the first three. Risk diversification, creating diversified asset pools, that's a good reason for, that, for a securitization. Distribution to long-term investors, um, there's a big demand for uh, fixed income securities, whether uh, by pension funds, US pension funds, or the world at large. We, we need to tap into that, uh, into that demand, so that's a good reason for securitization. Most importantly, I think uh, the best reason for securitization is um, it's very good, if it's done right, it's very good for uh, asset liability matching and risk management. Unfortunately, it hasn't been done right. It hasn't been done right because the, the fourth reason, conserving on capital, I think is not a good reason for securitization. It's the wrong, it's the wrong reason. Um, so let me get into this. Um, so if you do securitization properly, you are um, aligning, you, you are matching in maturity uh, assets and liabilities. It's a very simple idea. You, you're relying on, on um, deposit financing, short-term deposit financing to fund your mortgages. Your mortgages are long-term fixed interest uh, assets. That's a huge uh, uh, asset liability mismatch. You're very vulnerable to interest rate risk. How do you reduce that interest rate risk? You sell off these long-term assets immediately and then you, you hold on to the proceeds from that sale, you invest it, now you have well-matched assets and liabilities. That's what should have happened, that's not what happened. In the, at the opposite of that, what has happened is, is just increasing leverage. 
and even magnified maturity mismatch. We've had maturity uh, mismatch, maturity transformation in the shadow banking sector, which is highlighted by this picture, and this is truly puzzling. This is truly puzzling. Why? Uh, well, because, let me, let me skip over this slide uh, and uh, 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 go straight to uh, um, the point I want to make, um, which is uh, the following, and I'll come back. Don't worry, don't worry I'll come back. Uh, so the, what's puzzling about maturity mismatch, <coughs> maturity transformation in the shadow banking sector is this is done outside of the banking regulatory sector, outside the subsidy pr uh, afforded by deposit insurance. So you wonder why is this happening? And so that's just what I want to come back to uh, in a second. Um, how does this work? Well, this will make it easier. So what are the regulatory issues that we're facing? Uh, here's the ones that I've listed. I've already mentioned them earlier. Uh, and uh, let me go into them uh, one by one. Uh, I think one of the uh, first uh, suggestions I want to propose is that maybe there isn't that much to be gained uh, from doing securitization of bank balance sheets. There is an alternative. It's called cover bonds. It's uh, unfortunately not been used widely in US banks but it's widely used in Europe, uh, in European countries, and has a lot of advantages. Uh, so you can do the securitization just the way you do it off balance sheet in the US, but it remains on the balance sheet. The big advantage is that uh, you have recourse on uh, bank equity in case uh, one of those uh, covered bonds runs into trouble. You, cr you align incentives, uh, and uh, uh, that's an important advantage. So, Regulation uh, that will uh, um, go in the direction of encouraging covered bonds, I think, would be, in my view, um, a step uh, in the right direction. Um, let me now next turn to the role of uh, rating agencies, which I think uh, cuts across uh, many different countries. It's not a problem; just a problem uh, that we're facing in the U.S. And uh, interestingly, in this, on this uh, topic, there's been a lot of action uh, last week. Uh, there's been a, uh, a new uh, bill proposed in the Financial Services C uh, Committee of, of the House of Representatives. And I'm encouraged by this bill. There's a lot of uh, uh, things it proposes that go in the right direction to solve the conflicts of interest problem in, cr in rating agencies, solving the shopping problem uh, um, among issuers. Uh, let me just say one word about uh, why this is a very a delicate area uh, uh, for regulation. Um, and um, it's, it has to do with the last two items, competition and uh, NRSRO accreditation. Um, competition among rating agencies, we would like to encourage more competition. But this is an area where if you just say we want to have more entrants, more rating agencies, you may actually make things worse rather than better. Why is that? Well, because the new entrants, they will try and compete for market share by being even friendlier, excessively friendly to the issuers. You encourage more shopping, and you increase the conflict of interest problem. So you need to introduce competition in the right way. And here I'd like to uh, suggest a parallel with what Sarbanes-Oxley did uh, to some extent with the uh, auditing firms, and that is maybe you know, give a little bit of a, a, a boost to competition through regulation by, by maybe encouraging or mandating uh, rotation. You're not allowed to always go back to the same rating agency. Um, as far as uh, NRSRO accreditation uh, is concerned, I think this is an important thing uh, uh, that we have in current regulations. This is something that we should keep. This, I know this is a very uh, widely debated and, and contentious issue. Uh, but uh, my view is rating agencies play a fundamental role 
uh, in, in modern financial markets. What we need is to boost that role and, we, and not undermine it. Uh, and NRSRO accreditation goes in the direction of boosting the um, rating agency's role. Finally, let me come back to this question of maturity uh, transformation in the shadow banking industry. How, uh, uh, how did it happen? And here I want to uh, suggest uh, there's one area that maybe hasn't uh, received enough attention in current debates, and that has to do with the, the role of derivatives, credit default swaps, and uh, repos. The point is that uh, under current uh, bankruptcy laws in the U.S. and in many other countries, um, it just happens to be that uh, uh, credit default swaps and repos are exempt from an automatic stay in Chapter 11. Certainly, that's true in the U.S. No, you don't have to. You know, you don't have to think very deeply about this. This provides an important subsidy to those derivatives, and if anything, what we need is subsidies for long-term financing, not for extremely short-term financing such as repos. So let me just leave it at that and uh, open this up as a suggestion for maybe later questions. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Taka Ito. Taka Toshi Ito, excuse me. So used to call him Taka. Thank you very much. And you've, you've now heard um, the very rich uh, history of the Japanese uh, banking crisis told by um, the person who uh, dealt with it and um, the U.S. Uh, uh, banking crisis, uh, the, the very heart uh, of the problem, which is the securitization and um, the incentive um, uh, problems. So what I'd like to do is try to um, uh, briefly compare uh, the Japanese and U.S. Uh, uh, banking crisis and what are the similarities and what are the differences and where we are in the U.S. compared to the um, Japanese uh, decade-long uh, history. So as um, um, Patrick mentioned, the, um, the banking, all the banking crises have very similar pattern. Starts with a bubble, burst, next. Then the um, uh, denial by the government oh, there's no problem, it's just a small problem. Um, and uh, uh, finally, the government recognizes, yes, there is a problem. It's usually too late. Uh, it's a spread to the um, uh, many sectors uh, of the economy. And um, uh, smaller institutions start to fail. And I would say uh, that was 1992 to 1995 in Japan, that their problems are still small, I wish they had done a radical reform back then, then we wouldn't have the decade-long uh, uh, crisis. I think in the U.S. Uh, there was um, uh, signs of the stress uh, back in uh, 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 August of 2007. So that was a time that probably uh, um, some radical reforms to stop what would have happened, what would happen in, in uh, 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 13 months from that time. So um, uh, the government, the public, recognized the problem but you know, uh, failed to act uh, when the problem is small. Then the um, problem gets bigger and bigger and more institutions to start to fail and finally government start to act. But it's too late and also too little. So you start throwing money at the uh, uh, failing institutions, <coughs> but uh, you can't stop it because you are all, you know, chasing the uh, problem uh, from uh, from behind. Then explosion happens. That's the November 1997 Japan, and uh, September 2008 in the U.S. Okay. So here is a crisis, a systemic crisis you respond, big way. So in a sense, crisis gives the opportunity to the government to act correctly, finally, uh, to put down the fire uh, uh, once and for all. Usually, 
you know, it takes more than just once to uh, put down the fire, but, you know, uh, government acts. The, um, uh, in the case of Japan, the uh, responding to, um, as Hazel mentioned, the two big failures of the two, two big institutions failure, November 1997, they did several things. Mm -hmm. Hazel mentioned the uh, capital injection, yes, but in addition to that, they created uh, FSA, Financial Services Authority, which was, had a different name back then, but um, uh, FSA uh, is the same. And so this is an integrated uh, uh, regulator. Integrated means that banking, securities, and insurance all in one organization. Um, somewhat independent uh, from the government, although in the case of Japan, it's a part of the government, but the, it was recognized that they will act uh, independently, uh, independently from politicians' uh, uh, pressure, uh, and so on. So in a sense, within 12 months, they had the integrated uh, uh, regulator. The Japan did one more thing. They created the authority to nationalize institutions. If the FSA decides that uh, institution, financial institution is undercapitalized, not yet insolvent, but very uh, uh, undercapitalized, then FSA was endowed the power to take over the institution nationalize it and appoint the new uh, managers and the, uh, uh, make the radical uh, uh, reform. So those um, uh, capital injection money and the um, uh, FSA and the uh, power to nationalize, those three things uh, uh, Japan got in 1998. And this is a, a, a very big step in uh, solving the uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, banking crisis, and they started to do special examinations, um, although the first one was not uh, so strong. And actually, they did uh, nationalize two large banks in 1992, Long Term Credit Bank and uh, 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 NCB, National uh, Credit Bank. So this is a big event that uh, to take over internationally active, complex, uh, bank and uh, they unwind the, all the uh, transactions without uh, fail and um, uh, they uh, uh, clean up the bank and, and did IPO, uh, uh, sold, sold by auction uh, later. Okay? If the story ended there, it would have been a much happier ending, but you know, it, it didn't stop there. Three years later, the uh, crisis uh, came back again. Why? Because there, there was uh, accounting uh, 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 softness uh, uh, to allow that uh, undercapitalization uh, to go on. So 2002, Prime Minister Koizumi uh, heard the criticism of the FSA not uh, working well. So we economists complained that this uh, particular, uh, particular accounting uh, provision is, uh, is uh, hiding the, uh, uh, the undercapitalization. So there was a debate, I understand, the Hazel can correct me, that there was a debate in front of Prime Minister between uh, his predecessor, Yanagisawa, and uh, uh, Mr. Takenaka, debating whether banking system is okay or not. And uh, Hazel won, so Hazel got the job of FSA uh, minister. <laughs> First thing what he did, was that he said, correct me if I'm <laughs> I quote wrong, <laughs> that no bank is too big to fail. This made a hell out of the uh, bankers, okay? And um, uh, of course, he, uh, he got a lot of uh, criticism from banks that, uh, you know, are you insane? Are you gonna, are you gonna uh, put the, all the banks uh, uh, to, to bankruptcy? and so on, okay? So to make long story short, that he, um, uh, I think that backed out, back, uh, backtracked one step, but he puts the, all the right framework so that he can finally claim the victory uh, uh, next, uh, the following year. So it took eight months, but he finally put the, all the banks to act seriously to, to do the reform. And he had, uh, uh, as he mentioned, uh, nationalized, uh, almost national, de facto nationalized the uh, Risona Bank and actually nationalized Ashikaga Bank in 2003. 
this was the end. This was the end of the Japanese banking crisis. So starting from a very small problem, it took 10 years. Okay. Now, coming back to the U.S., where are we? Okay. And are we in uh, uh, 1998 or 2002 or are we uh, near the end? Okay. I thought, I thought up to uh, uh, Lehman and up to maybe top, creation of top, so uh, October, November of last year, I thought the U.S. was doing great. Great means that making the same mistakes that Japan did, <laughs> but doing it faster, four times faster than the U.S. Okay? You know, it's, it's like, uh, it's like a laundry cycle that you have to go through all the way to the, uh, uh, to the same cycle you have to go, but you know, doing it faster, that's good. <laughs> but I've been disappointed uh, in the last, um, um, last um, uh, 10 months of the progress in the U.S. Okay. One year after, one, um, I think the, um, uh, almost, uh, almost uh, uh, 15 months after this big explosion of Lehman Brothers and you know, many, many financial markets went to the cliff, you know, cliff edge and looked at the abyss. This was the opportunity to make a radical reform. This was a crisis, sense of crisis, a big push for the reform. U.S. Treasury failed, I would say. Okay? And so there is no integrated regulator. There is no nationalization, what, what we call here as uh, a resolution mechanism, which is a basically temporary nationalization mechanism. No resolution mechanism passed by the Congress. And uh, TARP is still drifting. That it has not um, uh, acted as the original, uh, to the original purpose yet. They create, you know, they change the uh, uh, contents of the top several times, but it's not working as to separate the bad assets and good, good assets. So I think the, um, um, Mr. Takenaka was very tough and rise to the occasion of the big crisis and won. Um, maybe I will not name the, men uh, na name the names, but uh, maybe the U.S. Treasury uh, person is too soft, too, too, na too, too nice a guy that uh, he, <laughs> he couldn't push the financial institutions uh, 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 to the position that they are scared to death, that uh, they have to do a big reform. So my proposal would be that I think the U.S. needs uh, 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 the single integrated regulator who can uh, do the, all the uh, stress tests and, and so on regularly. Uh, until the crisis is all over, and has the authority to do temporary nationalization or uh, resolution mechanism, resolution power. <clears throat> Why do we need resolution power? Well, that's uh, one, one, one benefit is to, to make a threat to the financial institutions that they have to act seriously and remove all the wrong incentives uh, uh, and so on, which uh, Patrick mentioned. And also, if needed, you exercise the power to uh, nationalize the institutions. What do, we, do you do uh, after nationalization? Well, you uh, uh, punish the shareholders, scrap the value of the shareholders, and change the management without bonuses. Um, and um, uh, you, you change the, uh, you, you can change, uh, basically it's a bankruptcy. So managed bankruptcy, as, uh, uh, as was mentioned. And so you, you can change all the contracts. Um, and, but the be added benefits is that you keep uh, doing the businesses for the short-term liabilities. You, you keep paying the overnight loans and uh, uh, one-week loans uh, uh, and, and so on. So um, um, that is very important to avoid the systemic risk. So nationalization is only mechanism to have the systemic stability and remove the uh, uh, moral hazard uh, problem. So uh, it was regrettable that uh, uh, Lehman Brothers happened uh, uh, six months between the Bear Stearns and, and uh, Lehman Brothers was wasted without creating, uh, creating the um, uh, nationalization power. But it's a scandal that after 15 months, you don't have this uh, uh, integrated uh, uh, regulator and the uh, resolution mechanism uh, uh, in the U.S. 
this last part, I think Japan did much better than the U.S., uh, I would say. So that's a lesson uh, from, uh, uh, from, from, from Japan. One, one added um, uh, complication now is that we do need international coordination on this uh, resolution mechanism. Because what happened after Lehman failed was that U.S. put the Chapter 11, and Japan puts the, uh, their own uh, bankruptcy law, and UK did. So they all ring-fenced. They're all Lehman Le Le Brothers uh, 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 units. And what would happen if the Japanese, uh, 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 Japanese customers' uh, uh, assets uh, um, that managed by Lehman Brothers as a primary broker, which was, um, um, uh, which was swapped to the uh, uh, New York office, booked in London, how can you unwind it? You can't. And because bankruptcy laws are different in three countries. And you cannot just unwind very simple swap agreement. And nine months is wasted, and lawyers collecting all the fees. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, you know, this bankruptcy is law applied to the financial institutions very wrong. That we need some international coordinated uh, framework to do the uh, resolution of the large international complex organization and unwind it and the, um, uh, return the assets to the customers when the customers have the right and uh, separate bad assets to good assets, bad bank, uh, good, uh, bad bank, good <coughs> bank model. And um, unless we get it, and unless we have the person like uh, Takenaka threatening the financial institutions, we don't have the good behavior of the financial institutions. All the wrong incentives Patrick mentioned will continue and in some other forms. And uh, uh, I worry that um, uh, well, we, we may repeat uh, in the future the similar kind of uh, 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 crisis. Thank you. Merit? Well, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I offer a few observations with a great deal of modesty, not being an expert in financial policy or an economist. But uh, being a lawyer, you know, we are trained to think we can uh, address any topic. And so I will uh, do my best. I guess I came into this discussion uh, uh, asking myself the questions that uh, uh, Taka Ito raised. That is to say, um, uh, uh, what are the institutional reforms uh, that we think uh, are necessary or essential coming out of this crisis, and what are the lessons from Japan's uh, experience. And I also thought last May that in the United States, uh, what we were going to see uh, by way of institutional reform was a substantial strengthening of the powers, uh, the explicit powers of the Fed uh, as a super regulator a significant expansion of the SEC, uh, more centralization of oversight over different markets, equities, options, futures, uh, the, mo the movement of certain types of instruments like CDS uh, and interest rate swaps onto exchanges, uh, steps to increase transparency of those instruments, new rules on capital, adequacy, limits on proprietary trading, and other such steps. I thought these were, were sort of uh, uh, the area of likely agreement. And they were, in fact, a lot of these features were reflected in the Treasury plan uh, that came out without a high degree of definition. But I think what we've seen is far less, as Taka is saying. And so I'm left wondering what are the necessary essential uh, institutional reforms uh, that have to be taken in the US. I think we have seen uh, quite a lot of consensus around the idea of strengthening some powers of the Fed and the SEC and the movement of CDSs and other um, OTC market type instruments onto exchanges. I see that as a constructive step. Um, but uh, there has been a lot of concern in the Congress about 
uh, the Fed and putting too much power into the Fed and this arguments about a lack of accountability and discomfort with the Fed as a super regulator, and now much more discussion about some council of systemic uh, 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 regulators. Um, and I guess it would seem to me that um, while it may be objectively obvious or useful to think of an integrated regulator, you do need to think about the culture in which that integrated regulator would operate and what the role of politics would be if there was such an integrated regulator in the United States. And I suppose I look at the last few months in the United States and I say, what role do I want Congress playing with respect to an integrated regulator in the United States? And I would say, I guess, a, a rather limited role. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I think we have to w worry about what we ask for if we envision, uh, I suppose, uh, what uh, 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 that might look like in the United States. Um, and so that's my worry, actually, is what role is politics going to play as we develop an instrument uh, of a uh, systemic uh, regulator? Um, I think there are many positive features of Japan's uh, uh, FSA. I've had the uh, pleasure of visiting it a few times and talking to a few people. And it is, uh, for Japan, quite an experiment, it would seem to me. And I'd invite uh, observations and comments by uh, Takenaka-san and, and Ito-san to tell us a bit more about about this experiment, because you have, for the first time, a, an agency with these broad powers and with people who come both from the private sector with the securities market experience and from MOF uh, and from the Justice Ministry, since it has both an enforcement feature and a supervisory feature, uh, working uh, together. Many of them are not, or some are not long-term bureaucrats. So it's this mixture, which is quite an experiment for uh, Japan, it would seem. And it seems to me that they act in a very professional fashion. They have a lot of expertise, and there are many fine features. Um, one dimension, though, that is uh, not so obviously strong to me uh, is uh, with respect to their actual supervision of financial markets. And uh, I'm not saying that it's weak. I'm just saying uh, that I find, uh, as my uh, role uh, as uh, chair of the NASDAQ exchange, uh, I get an awful lot of regular data, highly detailed data on how markets are operating and a close cooperation with the FINRA and uh, on uh, markets. And a lot of that supervision is embedded in technology itself uh, and complex patterns applied to the oversight of US equity markets. And my sense is that Japan has not yet invested, and it's an expensive undertaking and requires manpower and technology, invested in that kind of regulatory oversight uh, 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 of uh, principal markets. And uh, I think there's room there uh, uh, for, uh, for that investment. Um, so an integrated regulator based on the Japanese model, I think, has some very interesting features to it and very admirable. But again, uh, I'd be interested in comments on the extent to which, you, you know, that's really replicable. Uh, uh, in other environments. Great. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed and, and, and happy that we are uh, on time. Um, so I'm going to uh, open uh, the discussion up to the floor. Um, for questions, but before I do that, um, I'm going to abuse my position as uh, moderator and um, ask the, uh, the, the, the first uh, 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 question. Um, and it's, it's to follow on a little bit about um, what uh, 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 Taka was saying earlier. Um, so, uh, Hazel, you've been, uh, you, you were the point person in Japan in the midst of a banking crisis. Um, you 
uh, endured a firestorm when you uh, said no institution was too big to fail, um, kind of a, a, a really um, a stunning statement in the middle of a banking crisis that uh, really uh, put the fear of, uh, of, of God or the fear of gods in the uh, hearts of Japanese uh, bankers. Um, and uh, we haven't seen something similar uh, to that uh, in, in, in the U.S. in the current crisis. Um, so I guess, how do you view how the, how the U.S. has handled uh, the, 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 the crisis in the current uh, situation? Um, you know, do you, do you share Taka's uh, a view that uh, what they need is uh, a Takanaka plan to shape up our, mm -hmm. our, our system? Mm -hmm. Or what would you what would you advise uh, the U.S. to do? Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Well, <clears throat> basically, my first recognition uh, on this issue was Japanese case and American case are completely different. This is my first recognition because we had very typical banking crisis, but in this country you have money market crisis. The, in the case of banking crisis, well, banks are very seriously, very strictly regulated by legal framework. So it was relatively easy, honestly speaking, to supervise the banks. But in the case of money market crisis, the you know, through securitization, this asset was held by many uh, players. It was quite difficult to, you know, uh, estimated asset value, et cetera, et cetera. So techni technically speaking, your problem is much more complicated. That's my first experience. At the same time, the situation has been becoming relatively closer. This is another observation. That is one important message, and my, based on my experience is, it is completely impossible for politicians to understand the finance. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very important point. <laughs> finance is highly technical. <laughs> and do you, yes, Japanese polit politicians made a mistake. And American politicians ma made a very serious mistake. Right after the Lehman crisis, the uh, lower house denied the proposal of, of the Secretary of Treasury. Uh, so anyway, uh, government failure coincided with market failure. Consequently, the confidence crisis occurred. In this sense, this is quite similar. Once confidence crisis occurred, what should be done is very simple. The central bank and the government can, uh, should do anything that they can do. And actually, the US followed that kind of uh, uh, scenario. As for the direction of the policies, I think the Gaitner plan is correct as for the direction of the policies. And also, as was mentioned by our other speakers, speed was also very rapid compared with that of Japan. In the case of Japan, it took 12 years because Koizumi appeared, uh, before Koizumi appeared. But it took only one year or two years uh, in the case of the United States. So, so far it's good. However, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, my question, is simple question is whether uh, accurate assessment of asset is being done here or not? Maybe no. Maybe no. This is the reason why, uh, based upon so-called stress test, the estimate, uh, estimated value, which is the, the, sh the shortage in equity, was very much smaller than expected by IMF or some others. That's a problem. So again, I'd like to go back to the importance of asset assessment, the importance of so asset assessment. So taking this opportunity, I'd like to raise some other points regarding the, the difference between Japan and the United States. Well, regulatory framework is very much different between Japan and the United States. At the same time, if we study, do we, uh, other countries, we are aware, even compared with European countries, some other Asian countries, this system is very much different, very much varies. I wonder why. Uh, such an important uh, system uh, is different among, uh, so much among countries. So now it is very imp important uh, uh, chance for us to study the best practice. So best practice very seriously. As for Japan, I'd like to re add one more important point. That is the personnel issue. 
Yes, as I mentioned by merit, well, we compounded the, uh, some, uh, in order to create a financial service agency. We gathered from uh, some other agency, et cetera, et cetera. However, important point is these people never had experience in the market. They have all been living in Kasumigaseki as bureaucrats. <laughs> so important part is, yes, I worked in uh, FSA, but important people, the influential people, SFA, are all from Ministry of Finance bureaucrats. They do not have the experience of the market. That is another serious aspect of my country, I think. Of course, I, I, when I was a minister, I studied uh, recruiting uh, people from the market. Still, uh, the number of this uh, market experience, uh, the people in the market, is quite <coughs> limited. Uh, I really want to know your uh, experience. Uh, for example, Mr. Paulson used to be the Secretary of Treasury. He had much experience in the market. He used to be the chairman of Goldman Sachs. Uh, this is not the problem of the personal capability. That's a, this kind of uh, experience. So still, in the case of Japan, we need uh, some uh, structural problem as for bureaucrat issue. Uh, as I mentioned by Mr. Bolton, the market uh, financial market structure is uh, you know, very complicated and changing even at this moment. Uh, so we need some uh, new scheme to recruit the people. Uh, but anyway, important point is we had a very serious banking crisis, and you are suffering from money market crisis. That's the important point. Great. Thank you very much. So I'd like to open it up to uh, questions from the floor. Um, we have some, mic do we have microphones? Oh no, maybe we don't. Oh, we, have, we do have a microphone, good. Um, so if you could just wait for the microphones and uh, I'd like you to just uh, say your name uh, first um, and uh, then um, uh, an affiliation and then ask the question. Uh, so there's a hand up over here. Katsu, uh, Katsu uh, thank you for the speech. And then I have a question regarding the Japanese economy to uh, Professor Takenaka. Uh, today's Nikkei's uh, headline was uh, regarding the public sector debt of Japan, at the, which is about uh, uh, $8.5 trillion, uh, which would be the uh, historically highest level uh, in Japan, and then 160% uh, of the GDP. And my question to you is how many percent of Japanese public uh, debt sector is owned by foreign investors? And then also, also that uh, uh, reason of uh, uh, Demo Democratic Party of Japan hesitate to uh, privatize postal service of Japan, is this because that, that they own the large part of Japanese uh, public sector debt? Well, I expect my friend Takaito will follow my uh, <laughs> uh, explanation. But anyway, uh, it, yes, it is a very serious problem. Yes, uh, Japanese uh, fiscal deficit is uh, expanding a lot. And the debt GDP ratio is exceeding 170% at this moment. In the case of the United States, it's 90% uh, of 100% as a result of the recent expansion. But still, Japanese uh, debt uh, is huge. Well, uh, when I was the Minister for Economic and Fiscal Policy, I first introduced the concept of primary balance, assuming nominal growth rate and nominal interest rates are almost same in the long run. In this case, if we restore the primary balance, in this case, debt GDP ratio will decline. So uh, primary deficit was, uh, uh, for example, seven years ago, 28 trillion yen, but this had been declining to only 7 trillion yen at the end of Koizumi government. So if we could continue this trend for two more years, two, three more years or so, then we could recover. We could have recovered the primary uh, balance, primary, uh, primary surplus. However, everything has gone because of the fiscal expansion by ASO government. And the uh, DBJ government, as I mentioned, they do not have a concept of macroeconomic management. And then this ratio will, is expected to grow even from now. Under such circumstances, as was mentioned by uh, Takeda-san, uh, DBJ government uh, decided already, almost 
re-nationalize the Japan Post. Privatized the Japan Post will be re-nationalized. Uh, the purpose of this is, uh, y y your question is, uh, the purpose of nationalization is uh, to finance this public debt by uh, post, uh, postal saving money or not. But, well, this is not a direct reason, I think. Uh, they, uh, this initiative was uh, taken by Minister Kamei. Mi Mr. Minister Kamei does not have any concept of that kind of macro issue. <laughs> <laughs> they are thinking of only the next election <laughs> in order to get the support from our uh, postal post, uh, post bureau masters. So, but consequently, Mr. Treasury, uh, uh, a little bit pleased to find this. So, or the finance through uh, postal money could be continue or such and such. But anyway, uh, Ministry of Treasury people are also uh, considering more seriously how to rebuild this, uh, realize this is fiscal rehabilitation. But uh, anyway, sooner or later, uh, DPJ government will be forced to, uh, to create a new budget rehabilitation plan. Uh, again, it is important to restore the primary balance uh, as a very starting point of this fiscal rehabilitation. Okay, other questions? Um, over here, Alicia Ogawa. I'm David Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to address a question to Professor Bolton and to, and to Professor Takenaka about the issue of resolution mechanisms. Um, some people believe that there is a direct relationship between size and risk. Others believe that size doesn't necessarily make a, an institution risky of itself. I wonder how you, too, feel about that. And I also, as a follow-up, would ask whether you really believe that, Takanaka-san, that Mizuho would ever believe and behave as if it was not too big to fail. And I would ask the similar question of Professor Bolton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and, and, and I'm sorry, I, was, I think, did, Taka, did you also have a response to the last question? If you want to, okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, th I think this is an excellent question. Um, this is right at the heart of current debates, uh, and I've been uh, reading a little bit what um, the, um, some key um, people have been saying about this, uh, Paul Volcker, uh, Mervyn King, uh, and so on, uh, and um, I, I tend to side with what, uh, what they're saying. Uh, I think the big concern with uh, the current uh, uh, White House plan, which is to um, create a special category of institutions that are too big to fail, treat them separately, put them to a higher standard, impose higher capital uh, requirements and so on, the big concern I have with that is no matter how tough you are with those institutions, though the market will perceive them to be completely safe. The market will treat them like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And uh, we know what happened with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, uh, I think that's a serious issue. So I would actually side with what Paul Volcker has been saying. So find a way of breaking up these very large institutions so that no institution is too big to fail. That's easier said than done, though. Uh, I think it's very difficult to know, to know how to break those up. I don't think that returning to Glass-Steagall is uh, as obvious as uh, some people make it. Uh, um, so I think that's where the difficulty lies. Is how do we find a way of breaking up those institutions? Well, as, uh, uh, based upon my experience as a uh, uh, policy maker, honestly speaking, it is quite understandable to relate size and the risk. This is uh, from a practical point of view. In the case of, for example, big institutions, the impact of bankruptcy is very huge. So from a policymaker point of view, uh, it is important to consider this negative impact. In that sense, it is important to some extent, I think, to control the influential institution, influential financial institution, even if it's banks or security companies or investment banks, et cetera, et cetera, it is important now, practically important, to control these influential institutions as one category. Uh, this is now seriously considering the, the uh, relating size and the risk. Uh, so uh, I, I, I guess the real uh, policy framework will go to that, this direction, in my understanding. And uh, this is also related to the too big to fail. 
case. Well, uh, financial institutions more or less has the characteristics of uh, infrastructure, social infrastructure. It's very bank. Bank is a very typical case because a deposit, bank deposit, uh, plays as a role of the uh, settlement infrastructure. But but all but all other institutions also since. Uh, if this size is too big in this sense or some characteristics, it has a characteristics as an infrastructure. In that sense, I uh, use the term in the response in the diet, too big to fail. Uh, the, we should consider uh, the important nature. I was seriously criticized by media at that time. But anyway, uh, all banks understood the real meaning of what I would like to say, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, bankers are basically very smart. They basically understand what they should do. So uh, they collected their uh, policy attitude, uh, and they uh, seriously considered uh, the uh, capitalization again. I, I believe that. Um, Mike Reardon. Hi, Mike Reardon in the economics department. I, I guess I want to pick up on a, a theme that Merritt was, was sounding. And I, I wonder if there's a, a risk of being too easily lulled into a, a naive faith in, in regulators uh, to prevent something like this from happening again. Um, you know, as Merritt was suggesting, regulation is uh, almost inevitably a political process, even when there's, uh, uh, and politics can undermine regulators' uh, will to act, even if they have the powers to act. And there's other mechanisms at work. There's a revolving door. There's this relationship between regulators and industries, which affect incentives <coughs> and, a, and a will to act as well. And, you know, I was impressed by um, Taka's comment that, in both cases, there were signs of a gathering storm. You know, there, were, there, were, there was evidence of the problem when the problem was small. Uh, when something could have been done before large consequences happened. And I wonder if, if at that point in time the problem was that regulators didn't have the right tools to address the problem, or whether the problem was more that the regulators did not have the incentive or the will to to rec even recognize the problem, much much less address it. So it's, it's a question for, for everyone on the panel, really. Um, I don't know, should we go, yeah, go in order? Or, or actually, or, or merit, maybe? <laughs> uh, let me start that um, uh, in the case of the Japanese crisis, that regulators would say that um, they didn't have a tool. But I think tools can be created, of course. And uh, I would say they didn't have the will to, uh, to act. Um, so the back in 1992-95 that um, uh, the regulator uh, and regulated were too cozy in the relationship. So it's, it's a Japanese uh, version of a revolving door. It's not revolving door, but the golden parachute in case of Japan. And uh, the uh, the whining, dining sort of um, uh, borderline of uh, corruption was um, uh, very um, uh, evident. So they they uh, didn't have um, incentive to act. They just put some uh, rehabilitation plan, believing, putting assumption that uh, land price will go back up in five years. So um, uh, that that was the case when the uh, problems uh, were small. Others, let me speak last. Okay. Patrick. Um, so, uh, Mike, thank you for this uh, <coughs> uh, wonderful question. Uh, I think we, I'm in agreement with uh, with Merit. Regulators can only do so much uh, if they don't have the backing of the politicians behind them. Um, that's been a, that's been a recurrent problem in the U.S. financial regulatory history. It's not the first time that we've had uh, regulatory forbearance. We've had regulatory forbearance during the savings and loans crisis. And we've had the regulators trying to stop savings and loans, closing the insolvent lo uh, savings and loans, being stopped by Congress, by the Congressional Committee supervising 
the uh, regulatory agency. So we do need to pay attention to uh, politics, uh, special interests, uh, and how um, the, the, the conflict among different special interests plays out. And, and I think in the current crisis, what worries me is what we're seeing right now uh, uh, taking place in Congress regarding the role um, of the Fed versus some other super regulator. And uh, I'm, particularly, uh, I'm particularly concerned by the new developments, trying to, uh, these new attempts uh, in Congress to try and remove authority from the Fed, uh, try and uh, encroach on its independence, try and make sure that the new regulatory powers that were destined for the Fed uh, will not be given to the Fed. I, th I, I detect behind all of these movements uh, a financial lobby which would rather have someone else but the Fed uh, be in charge because the Fed, one of the things that sets it aside, it's more independent than other agencies. It's more independent because it doesn't have to rely on Congress for its funding, unlike other agencies. So I, th I, I think very much uh, this is a huge issue uh, right now. Well, I do not have a complete answer, complete answer on that issue. This is very uh, naive and difficult problem, I think. But in the case of Japan, we have a little bit different angle of problems. Well, for example, a bureaucrat, always bureaucrat, as I mentioned. So in this case, in such cases, they are very much, very nervous about the past policy that they had. So they do not have any incentive to change the policy. Uh, if we, they change the policy, they, they are you know, concerned they will be claimed or criticized. The past policy was wrong. So in that sense, uh, I dare to say the evolving <laughs> door is sometimes effective or no bad, not bad. So this kind of combination is a very naive, uh, very important issue. <coughs> Can, can I answer? Oh. Just, uh, yeah, that reminds me of something that the, when uh, Takanaka-san was um, uh, declaring this uh, 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 no, no bank is too, too big to fail, and one of the comments came, came, uh, came back from the, um, um, the bank was that, oh, that's, that's like a changing a rule in the middle of the game. And, you know, <laughs> we, we thought we are playing the soccer. Now he came in and, and tells us to uh, play the American football. <laughs> <laughs> That's wrong. Right. So, uh, you know, past policies are very important uh, in, in the um, uh, bureaucracy uh, uh, system. Legacy. Uh, Merit? Yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful question. I guess um, uh, I do think that there are lessons from this period on gaps in coverage. And I think uh, 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 you know we could talk at length about that in terms of, of uh, too much segmentation uh, of uh, agencies and what they reviewed. And so whether you end up with uh, an integrated regulator or more coordination mm -hmm. or some re-regulation, I think there are there's a long discussion we could talk about on that front. So there's gaps, and that's also incentives. I think Hazo mentioned a very important issue also, which is the culture of institutions when he was saying they need more people that are market-oriented. I think that could be equally said in the United States when it comes to the SEC, and Mary Shapiro has made that point uh, uh, as well. So there's a, there are cultural uh, sort of embedded expertise uh, uh, and sort of the, the, the extent to which um, regulators uh, are actually market people uh, uh, is a problem. There are too many lawyers who are not close to markets, I think, uh, uh, in charge of financial oversight. So I think we need to mix them <coughs> up uh, more. Uh, that might be one thought. I share Patrick's uh, uh, view, of course, that the Fed is the most independent agency, and, and if there is to be a systemic regulator, I would want them more in charge than anyone else. Um, although it's a new function for them, I think, and so uh, 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 they would have to be some change in its own culture, one might presume, to be able to do that effectively, even though one would feel they would be the least politicized actor to undertake it. So it's very complex, isn't it? But I, I, I think uh, all these adjustments might be needed. Great. Uh, so time for one more question. Perhaps. 
My name is Jennifer Dwyer. This sort of follows on the political aspect of things, but certainly people know that when Professor Takenaka was in the Council on Economic and uh, Fiscal Policy, uh, his expertise in economics, his independence from politics, and his personality were viewed as playing a very important role. Several people mentioned that uh, today. And it's not surprising that once he left, the role of that council seemed to deteriorate say much somewhat under future prime ministers. Similarly, uh, Professor Ito suggested that some personalities, a person in the Treasury might not have essentially strong enough leadership. And this brings up the question of the relationship between institutional reform, if we create this overarching institution, whether it be this new uh, national strategy bureau, will the structural changes, the institutional changes be adequate in Japan or in the United States, or does it really come down to who we put in those positions? Um, because it does seem that in many of these cases, personality and leadership played a really important role, which of course is troubling for those of us who are interested in institutional structure. But the, your experience seems to suggest that had you not been in that position, the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy might not have played as important a role and banking uh, restructuring might not have taken place. So I, if you could just, I don't know if you can speak to this issue, but the relationship between institutional change, we, we're focusing on that, but unfortunately it seems that choosing the right person seems to be at least as important. And I don't know how we do that. Well, <clears throat> well first of all, I'd like to say in institutional arrangement is of course very important. However, in the case of the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy, uh, for some period it works well, but in the very last part of the LDP government, in Aso government, it didn't work well. So personnel issue or personnel aspect or especially leadership uh, the, uh, is a much more important, I'd like to say. In the case of DPJ, uh, he, they declared to abolish uh, the Council on Economic Fiscal Policy. But they say it's correct because Council on Economic Fiscal Policy, the coverage is only economic fiscal policy. A national strategy, strategy bureau can deal with even the diplomatic policy or energy uh, security policy, etc., etc. So the coverage is, uh, you know, uh, enlarged. And also, uh, in the case of uh, economic fiscal policy, the purpose or the function is just to discuss and advise. Well, in the case of a national strategy, they say the function is to decide something. Yes, if they can do that, that's good. I think so. However, even in this case, it depends on the uh, leadership. Uh, well, especially, uh, uh, not my role, the, the role of prime minister. Prime minister is very important. This is true even in the case of the Council of Economic Advisors in this country. Great. Uh, well, well um, I want to thank, uh, have everyone join me in thanking our speakers for what I think was a...